big pleasure to have Mr. John Rubino back on this show as gold has literally met, I think, and maybe even is exceeding some of his recent calls and expectations. Hi, John. Hey, Chris. Yeah, it, it, about time we had something really fun to talk about, huh? Because it's it's been since like 2016 um, since there's been any real excitement in the precious metals market. And and the last couple of weeks were definitely exciting. You know, gold, well, where did gold settle? It's like 2150 or 2250 now, right? Something like that. Well, I hopefully that's popping up on the chart here. We've got a little uh, treat for our viewers not just Mr. John Rubino, but hopefully the futures, gold futures. Is that populating there? Yeah, I see it. Oh, perfect. Okay, so um, 2240-ish, and I'll bet at some point it was right at 22. Hey, well, let's look at a daily. That would probably be a little easier to find our intra-week, if you will, and we'll see here. Uh, yes, sir, I would say we topped 2250, maybe 2270. I'm sorry, 2257, somewhere in there. So you're right on spot. Um, so this is what we've been waiting for. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and obviously, there, there's a lot further to run down the road. You know, gold gold is going to 5000 and then to $10,000 before this whole thing is over. So this is a nice start. And um, it, it, you know, irregularly will continue. There's going to be corrections and things along the road, but um, at, at the rate we're um, taking on new debt and um, inflating away the world's currencies, there's no doubt that gold is going to go much higher in debased currency terms. In other words, in dollar terms, gold um, is headed nowhere but up over time. Now, the question, um, I, I think, Anybody who's trading in the gold market or deciding whether to uh, buy now or wait a few months um, is that uh, it may have gotten them ahead of itself a little bit right now. You know, there could be a correction um, starting soon. Um, and there's also seasonality to take into account. I've been fooled so many times by strong um, early springs in gold only for the whole sell in May and go away thing to kick in. And so um, this is fun. We, we should enjoy it, but we shouldn't take this as a sign of unending things to come. There are going to be corrections and there's going to be a lot of bouncing around. Uh, but in general, nice to see it. And then the, you know, the next step in this process is for the gold miners to start rising along with gold and then start to exceed gold's percentage gains. And that, that hasn't happened yet, but last week, there were quite a few miners who had nice pops along with gold. And that's a good sign. That means that uh, people are starting to pay attention to the broad sector, not just the gold price. Absolutely. You know, we've got the XAU. Uh, sh let's see if I can get, I think we want to just go with regular XAU here instead of the minis. Let's see, XAU. And hopefully we can get some attention. There we go. Okay, so you're right. I mean, XAU is definitely showing signs of life. Philadelphia Gold and Silver Sector Index on the weekly chart. Um, we've had, what, almost two months now. Um, but we haven't quite broken out. So you think that we're waiting, we're still in a waiting pattern. Investors, they just, they, they can't get their minds can they around the idea of gold being the investment du jour. Well, uh, you know, gold has only been exciting for an extremely short time here. Because remember, what, what happened in, in the previous four or five years is that it uh, it bounced off 2,000 and went back down and bounced off 2,000 and went back down. So, um, you know, it takes a, a lot of contrary information to change people's minds. And a lot of people's minds are pretty much um, made up about gold, that it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> especially compared to NVIDIA and Bitcoin and things like that. So I, I think gold going up into the 2200s is a really good start, but it's going to take more to get people excited. And um, and by implication, it's going to take even more than that to, um, to get people excited about the miners. So this will all happen. It's just that it takes a little while for people's minds to change after a long stretch that convinced them that um, the situation was a certain way. Uh, but, I, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now that um, that kind of points towards rising instability, which in turn is good for precious metals because they're, they're where you hide out 
when the world is chaotic and man, you know, the Middle East, just that alone is probably enough for a nice pop and gold because, you know, we've got um, the Russian terror attack um, and France considering sending troops into Ukraine, Russia saying that um, you know, it's not going to invade NATO, but um, any NATO troops within Ukraine are fair game. Um, so we're very close to um, NATO and Russian soldiers shooting at each other. Meanwhile, Russia is also bombing some of Ukraine's energy assets, which, uh, which are pretty considerable, you know, and oil has gone from $70 three months ago to $83 today. So you've got a lot of factors out there pointing towards one, higher inflation, two, geopolitical instability, and therefore three, rising precious metals prices. So, uh, you know, you, you don't want it to be that way. Like this, this isn't how we should be hoping to make money from gold because it's terrible for so many people out there. But it is one of the ways in which gold catches a bid historically. When the world just starts to go crazy, people want to hide out. And I think that's part of the dynamic with gold right now is that uh, there's so much stuff going on out there that is so terrifying that with your money, um, you want to um, buy things that are the opposite of terrifying, which is what precious metals are. They just hold their value over long periods of time. In gold's case, 3,000 years. Uh, and there are times when stability is the most important thing. And I think we're entering one of those times very possibly. Okay, John, stability. I mean, you threw a lot onto the plate there because we're talking about um, serious ratcheting up of conflict, specifically there in Eurasia, right? I mean, I don't know if you saw yesterday, I believe the Polish military or government demanded uh, conscript, uh, conscription <laughs> to return as a potential for increasing its military might. Um, my feeling is, you know, even the Axis countries in the last world war, you know, they rarely announced they were planning to invade a country. They usually would say, oh, no, we know we're not, we're your friends. We just wanted to expand our borders a bit. So who is to say whether or not Europe is really off the table here as a potential, uh, chess piece in this match? Um, anything else you want to go into there as far as, um, you know, geopolitical issues before we move on? Well, um, no, that's the big ge geopolitical thing right now. I mean, China is always there. You know, the U.S. has China surrounded <laughs> with military bases uh, and uh, is kind of sort of picking a fight there, too. But uh, I think the uh, the really hot zone is Ukraine and Russia right now. And I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, let me just say it, this is NATO's fault from beginning to end. We've been expanding an anti-Russia military alliance right up to Russia's borders. And uh, they've been saying for a long time that Ukraine was the, uh, was the red line that we shouldn't cross. We crossed it. And, uh, and now we're, we're kind of getting what we apparently hoped for. And yeah. th there are people in charge of the U.S. government who hope for a lot more than this. They want to basically take Russia off the chessboard and gain control of Russia's resources. Uh, and, you know, the, the lunacy of trying to do that with a nuclear power is just so off the charts. It's just completely incomprehensible. And hopefully we pull back before we actually do start World War III. But um, right now it's not clear that, um, that anybody wants to pull back in the US foreign policy establishment. So this is incredibly dangerous. And it's the kind of thing that we, we you know, especially if you've got kids. I mean, I have two kids and the idea of them being incinerated in a nuclear war or drafted into some absolutely insane fight on the other side of the world is just terrifying. So as a, as a, I'm, I'm looking at this more as a parent now than as a gold bug investor. So yes, we will make money in our gold and silver if things really heat up but it might come at uh, a cost that we consider to be too high. So let's just hope that's not how it happens. No, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the uh, concern about nuclear conflict, it seems to be really a, a red button issue. I mean, everyone seems to be, Hal Turner, of course, so many, uh, Mike Adams, yourself, are, are very concerned about it. We have two uh, children now, What you know, a miracle. I know how you feel, um, very worried about 
about not just nuclear, but conventional war. You know, Will, I have two sons, you know, I, I wasn't blessed with a daughter. And so I worry about whether or not, you know, it'll be one of those, um, should I sh- or shouldn't I, Dad? Or will we even have an option there? But uh, I guess that's just part of parenthood, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, John, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it is indeed part of parenthood. You know, you never stop worrying about your kids. Yeah, exactly. Lifelong yeah. thing. Um, and I still have one parent with us, you know, knock on wood and what a blessing that is. And I, I think she she won't admit it, but also <laughs> still is concerned about especially her eldest son. Uh, but at any rate, uh, John, back on point, you know, uh, stocks. I wanted to pull up the chart here of the S&P 500. I know that's not our forte today, but hopefully we all can see that S&P on a weekly basis is just defying gravity. Yeah, U- U.S. stocks, actually global stocks, but let, let's just talk about U.S. stocks. We are are back to one of those kind of 1999 situations where the um, the big market indexes are supported by just a handful of stocks that are wildly overvalued, but that, that everybody thinks are bulletproof. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, at times like this, people see um, the big tech stocks, for instance, as actually the risk-free assets in the market. Because I think if you buy Google or Nvidia or something like that, um, you can never lose. That's, that's the mentality that takes hold when something has been going up for as long as tech stocks have. Uh, Everywhere and always, that is eventually proven wrong. Uh, You can go back to the nifty 50s in the 1970s and then junk bonds in the 1980s and then the dot-coms in the 1990s and then the housing stocks in the 2000s. Um, uh, The conventional wisdom was that you could not lose in those things and and you ended up losing massively in those things. And I think that's where we are again. Um, And at some point, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ are going to crash hard, but you just can't know when it is. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a big short kind of um, trade out there and some people will time it right and they'll make life changing money. Uh, but everybody else who tries it will get the timing wrong and they'll, they'll lose their shirts or they'll maybe make, make out just at the end, you know, when everything comes back and their losses turn into a break even. But uh, it, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. And a- after the experience of the housing bubble bursting in the 2000s and how much money there was to be made by betting against that bubble, um, I really want to bet against the everything bubble. You know, I'm, I'm compelled to do that. And I do have some NASDAQ shorts and some S&P 500 shorts, um, but so far they haven't worked out and there's no guarantee that they work out anytime soon. Uh, but I, I, you know, I have a co- kind of a compulsion to try to be there when it does turn because I, I want that feeling again to be, to be short the the market and have the market crash. That's uh, that's incredible validation when it happens. But um, yeah, stocks are wildly overvalued, um, but that doesn't mean they can't go up from here, uh, in part because of global geopolitics. You know, um, U.S. stocks are seen, U.S. assets in general are seen as the safe haven assets of the world. So the crazier the world gets, the more foreign money flows into U.S. financial markets. And that um, that sounds kind of counterintuitive. You know, you shouldn't be buying stocks or high-end real estate when the world is getting crazy. But um, But if it's crazier where you are, then the U.S. looks kind of safe, and and that's what's happening right now. You know, Martin Armstrong Armstrong has been saying this for a long time that, uh, that yeah, stocks aren't going to crash, the dollar's not going to crash, because where else is that money going to go? You know, if you're in Brazil or China or Russia or big chunks of Europe, um, or pretty much anywhere else in the world, you look at the U.S. as a place to stash your you know risk-free quote-unquote assets. And, uh, and that's probably part of the dynamic right now. That's why U.S. stocks are up the way they are, in part because we've got a, uh, a new tech bubble going on and in part because the rest of the world sees us as the risk free place to be. So I don't know when that changes, but I, I can say with a high degree of certainty that when it does change, it's going to be a hell of a bust because the everything bubble is just immense now. There's nothing that has ever happened like this in history in terms of multiple bubbles taking place in the same financial uh, cycle. 
And when one bursts, the rest of them are going to go, and it's going to be just epic. And you know, we have to hope we're not in, in standing in the way of something like that when it happens. Yeah, you know, John, the everything bubble I think perfectly encapsulates what we're seeing here. You know, I mean, find me a sector that hasn't bubbled yet. I mean, maybe you could make a case for silver, gold, uh, and certainly their shares. But I mean, cocoa or cacao. You know, already to the to the moon coffee. I mean, it seems like everywhere we look, um, it's just emblematic. I think you'd say of the end game, don't you think? Of fiat money. Um, if we look back, it doesn't. You don't have to go all the way back to, you know, uh, France or anything. I mean, just Zimbabwe or Venezuela, or Argentina. We see this same similar cycle, don't we? Or is this even bigger than all that? Is this a whole new game? Well, you're right about us being towards the end of the fiat currency experiment. You know, we started in 1971 by completely going off the gold standard. And ever since, um, we've been abusing the kind of unlimited credit card that that gave governments. They've been borrowing more and more money. And now, in the U.S. especially, debt levels and the related interest costs are going straight up. So you, you can't have debt go parabolic and not have it blow up on you eventually. And that's where we are right now. Um, and, and you mentioned that gold, silver, and the related mining stocks are pretty much the only things that don't seem overvalued. And you're right. You know, if you're a, a value investor, um, gold and silver and the miners would jump out at you on your charts of, uh, you know, P-E ratios relative to history and um, stock prices relative to history and things like that. You know, you would, uh, you would be looking at these things as assets that haven't entered a bubble phase yet. And because of that, maybe they're cheap and maybe they're interesting. I think I, that's absolutely right. You know, the, uh, the mining stocks are incredibly cheap, even compared to gold and silver, which are still relatively cheap compared to their own histories. Um, well, okay, gold is up. Um, and it's at an all-time record in nominal terms and almost an all-time record in inflation-adjusted terms. But its previous highs happened when there was, you know, a fraction of the debt that there is out there today and a fraction of the fiat currency being created. So gold, um, to match its previous highs by those metrics, ought to be $10,000 an ounce right now. So I, I think gold is nowhere near its high. But the miners, meanwhile, are near their lows. And I think that uh, once precious metals really get going and once the miners then become hot stocks because they're going up so fast, uh, we get some serious action in the miners too. And that's, uh, that's a reason to buy them now. Um, not a reason to expect to make huge amounts of money in the short run, but it's a, a reason to own them with the idea that their parabolic spike is coming you know it's just not here now and there's no way to know when it comes but that it'll come pretty soon because the fiat currencies that um, basically determine the mining stocks values they're dying and they're dying at an accelerating rate so our time is coming chris i like the sound of that i like the sound of our time is coming and in some ways it looks like our time is here with gold so um, up at record highs, as you say, maybe not inflation adjusted. And that is important. That is important, right? Because that's our real for our economists, you know, or, or armchair economists in the audience today. That's our real number, which uh, adjusts for monetary profligacy and related inflation. But, uh, John, I, I did toss up on the screen here is Silver Futures. Hopefully that's populating. We got a monthly chart. One of the most beautiful patterns for our technicians in the crowd um, that I think you could imagine cup and handle within a cup and handle within a super long term. If we go back far enough, a cup and handle, as you see right there. So um, as usual, does silver lag gold this time? And uh, do you think 2024 could be the year where we play catch up? Well, the way precious metals bull markets work is that um, money flows into the, the big safe haven asset gold first and gold starts to go up. And it behaves pretty well. And then eventually it goes parabolic towards the end. You know, there's a, maybe a two year stretch when gold just goes straight up. Now silver starts more slowly because people are buying gold to begin with. But then gold gets really expensive relative to silver and people start thinking, wow, look, look how many 
ounces of silver I can get, you know, and th thinking about how pretty that would look on the table, 75 silver coins or something like that compared to one Kruger amp or gold eagle or whatever. And so they start buying silver and then silver starts to outperform gold on um, in, in percentage terms. And then towards the end, silver also goes straight up, but that equates to a much bigger increase in percentage terms than gold's parabolic rise does. So silver outperforms gold at the end and just does amazing things. I mean, it's gone from a few dollars an ounce to $50 an ounce twice in our lifetimes. And the, the parabolic rise that's coming ought to be much bigger than that. So we, we should see gold in the five to $10,000 range and uh, the gold to silver ratio going down to 30 or 40 because people are excited about silver at that point which takes silver into two or three or four or five hundred dollar ranges you know you uh, you get these numbers that just sound crazy right now um and you know you shouldn't jump into silver with leverage based on the expectation of that happening right away but that probably is where we end up you know with a parabolic rise in gold a bigger one in silver and the stackers finding themselves suddenly very rich. You know, that's, of course, music to our listeners, right? <laughs> and all of us <laughs> who are, in, you know, entrenched in the precious metal sector. But, you know, a quick look here, technically, monthly chart going back to our 1980s peak, our 2010, 2011 peak, okay, in silver. Where's the resistance? If we get through 50 on a convincing weekly and monthly close, I'd like to know, what could stop the market from fulfilling your seemingly lofty targets? Well, there's a, there's a lot of resistance points for silver on the way up. I think 30 is going to be a big one and, um, and then 40 and then 50 is going to be massive because that is the, the point at which in both of silver's previous parabolic bull markets, it, um, it stopped and plunged. So there will be just, there will be sell orders just lined up at 50. And it's possible that it has to, you know, speaking technically, it's got to test that a few times, right? It goes up to 50, gets smacked down to 38. Goes up to 50 again, gets smacked down to 42. Breaks through 50 and, and meanders around and, and hits 55 and gets smacked down again. That's the kind of thing we'll have to expect and, um, and not be demoralized by and not bail. You know, you, you can definitely take some profits at, uh, at stages on the way up, and you really should. You know, you should sell a little bit at 30, sell a little bit at 40, sell a little bit at 50, on the assumption that there'll be corrections after those, uh, those big resistance points are hit. And then you can, you can buy a little bit more um, after the correction. Um, but a big part of your precious metals ought to be um, untouchable. You know, you get it, you put it away, it's generational wealth. And, and you, you, know, you don't kick around with these, um, these resistance points and then corrections and then buying more. You, know, you, can, you can trade some of your capital in that way because it's fun, keeps you involved in the market. But um, selling too much on the way up means you miss that parabolic rise at the end. And you know, we're probably talking about a parabolic rise of, uh, from 50 to 150. And, uh, and then more resistance. And then from 150 to uh, two or 300, you know, that, that's how this is going to play out towards the very end when the dollar is, um, is dying in its current form. You know, the dollar won't cease to exist. It'll just be reset. We'll have a thing called a dollar. It'll just be probably, you know, defined as one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold under a gold standard or something like that. Um, and so because of that, you want to keep a core precious metals position that you do not trade, that it just sits there, that's uh, the bedrock part of your personal wealth and of your, you know, your successor's wealth. That, that goes from you to your kids to your grandkids and um, keeps them from being poor, you know, and gives them capital to do things with in the future. So don't trade Great. that. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, don't trade away your future. I like that. Don't sell yourself short as the market mm -hmm. axiom goes. And um, there's a lot of wisdom compressed in there from John Rubino today. And I really like your idea that this time it really could be. You know, we always get nervous, right, when we hear it's different this time. But this time it really could be because there's nothing in any market technician or fundamentalists, I think, toolbox that says this thing has to stop at 50 this time. 
I've never seen momentum build up like this. I mean, it is just a coiled spring. Where we stop, I'll leave that to, you know, the brilliant minds of people and analysts like yourself and in your camp. But I don't see any reason why we could not eclipse three digits here um, as a starting point. So very exciting times. Oh, and, and not for the um, <laughs> for those who can't stand volatility, maybe not the best sector. <laughs> to be yeah. in, so. Well, and it never has been. Silver's always been yeah. hair raising, right? You know, it's, it's had these wild moves and there's no reason to think it doesn't have more in its future. Exactly. And, you know, volatility is our friend, right? I mean, if you are on the right side of a bull market and let's face it, you know, when it's a bull market, you go long. Uh, volatility is certainly to your benefit until we stop making new highs and new lows. It's really that simple. We don't have to outthink the market, but we we must be proactive versus the reactive mind. And I think that's much easier said than done sometimes, especially when there's big dollar figures on the line. All right, John Rubino, fantastic stuff as always. The most unique, and I think, comprehensive um, work out there. And I so huge hat tip. Can you tell people about all the great stuff you're doing? Oh, and by the way, I didn't even give you a chance to uh, – Give us your parting thoughts. I mean, what should we be expecting that we haven't covered so far? Have we covered all the bases? Well, we should be expecting volatility. The world is really chaotic right now. And all kinds of things that uh, don't seem possible in normal times are liable to happen going forward. And we, we, you know, we need to be prepping pretty aggressively for what could be one of the um, the decades that you wish you didn't have to live through, <laughs> but you, you end up do having to live through it. So... Um, we, we should be definitely preparing across the board, not just investing, but with our careers, with our, you know, our houses, with our families, with our communities, um, doing everything we can to become resilient. And that's that, that's really the important word to take away from all this is we need to be able to uh, to manage complexity in a constructive way. It, you and, know, it, it re I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, that, you, you go ahead, Chris. No, I was just going to mention that your your comments sparked. A thought about Nassim Taleb's, you know, anti-fragility and this whole concept that markets, economies, households, humans, you know, virtually everything is much more fragile than we tend to recognize. And I think that you really speak to that, your whole narrative of let's start preparing. Um, and you know what? Almost all our guests here on Gold Seek Ready, many of whom have decades of not just life experiences, but, you know, have written tomes and educated tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, millions in some cases of people for decades are all lining up. It's it's not quite a perfect melody, but harmonizing with your thoughts today. Hey, you know what? If you don't have a few months or a couple of years food supply in your pantry, maybe now's the time because it's not going to get any cheaper. <laughs> thing that you buy um, and gold and silver might help encapsulate and crystallize what you've worked so hard for. Um, John, parting thoughts and all the neat stuff you're working on. Yeah, I'm at uh, rubino.substack.com and I'm publishing a newsletter there that covers most of this stuff that we talked about today, you know, especially with the kind of broad based um, prepping that we should be doing for a complex world. Um, and so far so good. It's a one year old newsletter that has a, a nice little community coalescing around it. Yeah, John, I got to thank you for convincing me, uh, you and uh, Dr. Kotlikoff and so many others. Uh, I thought, hey, you know, I, they're, I'm going to follow in their footsteps and get back into this whole newsletter thing. And it's been fun. It brings in people, doesn't it, who are like minded. They give you ideas. You, you play your ideas off of them. And uh, if they want to sign up for the extra content, that's great. And if not, you know, you've got some new pals. So um, I like it. I think it's organic and it uh, certainly is a. Wouldn't you say user-friendly way to share your opinion and thoughts? Absolutely, yeah. Hey, John, I can't thank you enough. I mean, just the best stuff. Will you please return soon? I absolutely will, Chris. Look forward to speaking to you next time. You as well. Have a great weekend. Thanks.